Chapter Two, The Ancient Treasure House. This wasn't a garden," said Susan presently. "It was a castle, and this must have been the courtyard." I see what you mean," said Peter. "Yes, that is the remains of a tower, and there is what used to be a flight of steps going up to the top of the walls, and look at those other steps, the broad, shallow ones." Going up to that doorway, it must have been the door into the great hall. Ages ago, by the look of it," said Edmund. "Yes, ages ago," said Peter. "I wish we could find out who the people were that lived in this castle and how long ago." "It gives me a queer feeling," said Lucy. "Does it, Lou?" said Peter, turning and looking hard at her. "Because it does the same to me. It is the queerest thing." That has happened this queer day. I wonder where we are and what it all means. While they were talking, they had crossed the courtyard and gone through the other doorway into what had once been the hall. This was now very like the courtyard, for the roof had long since disappeared, and it was merely another space of grass and daisies, except that it was shorter and narrower. And the walls were higher. Across the far end, there was a kind of terrace about three feet higher than the rest. I wonder, was it really the hall? Said Susan. What is that terrace kind of thing? Why, you silly! Said Peter, who had become strangely excited. Don't you see? That was the days where the high table was, where the king and the great lords sat. Any one would think you had forgotten that we ourselves were once kings and queens, and sat on a day just like that in our great hall, in our castle of Care Paravel," continued Susan in a dreamy and rather sing-song voice, at the mouth of the great river of Narnia. How could I forget? How it all comes back," said Lucy. We could pretend we were in Care Paravel now. This hall must have been very like the great hall we feasted in, but unfortunately without the feast," said Edmund. "It's getting late, you know. Look how long the shadows are, and have you noticed that it isn't so hot? We shall need a campfire if we've got to spend the night here," said Peter. "I've got matches. Let's go and see." If we can collect some dry wood, every one saw the sense of this, and for the next half hour they were busy. The orchard through which they had first come into the ruins turned out not to be a good place for firewood. They tried the other side of the castle, passing out of the hall by a little side door into a maze of stony humps and hollows, which must once have been passages. And smaller rooms, but was now all nettles and wild roses. Beyond this, they found a wide gap in the castle wall, and stepped through it into a wood of darker and bigger trees, where they found dead branches and rotten wood, and sticks and dry leaves and fir cones in plenty. They went to and fro with bundles until they had a good pile on the days. At the fifth journey, they found the well just outside the hall, hidden in weeds, but clean and fresh, and deep. When they had cleared these away, the remains of a stone pavement ran half way round it. Then the girls went out to pick some more apples, and the boys built the fire. On the days and fairly close to the corner between two walls, which they thought would be the snuggest and warmest place, they had great difficulty in lighting it and used a lot of matches, but they succeeded in the end. Finally, all four sat down with their backs to the wall and their faces to the fire. They tried roasting some of the apples on the ends of sticks. But roast apples are not much good without sugar, and they are too hot to eat with your fingers till they are too cold to be worth eating. So they had to content themselves with raw apples, which, 
as Edmund said, made one realize that school suppers weren't so bad after all. I shouldn't mind a good thick slice of bread and margarine this minute, he added. But the spirit of adventure was rising in them all, and no one really wanted to be back at school. Shortly after the last apple had been eaten, Susan went out to the well to get another drink. When she came back, she was carrying something in her hand. Look, she said in a rather choking kind of voice, I found it by the well. She handed it to Peter and sat down. The others thought she looked and sounded as if she might be going to cry. Edmund and Lucy eagerly bent forward to see what was in Peter's hand. A little, bright thing that gleamed in the firelight. "'Well, I'm—I'm I'm jiggered,' said Peter, and his voice also sounded queer. Then he handed it to the others. All now saw what it was, a little chest knight, ordinary in size, but extraordinarily heavy, because it was made of pure gold, and the eyes in the horse's head were two tiny little rubies, or rather one was— for the other had been knocked out. "'Why,' said Lucy, "'it's exactly like one of the golden chessmen we used to play with when we were kings and queens at Cape Paravel.' "'Cheer up, Sue,' said Peter to his other sister. "'I can't help it,' said Susan. "'It brought back—oh, such lovely times! And I remembered playing chess with fawns and good giants.' and the mer-people singing in the sea, and my beautiful horse, and—and—and— and, Now, said Peter in a quite different voice, it's about time we four started using our brains. What about? asked Edmund. Have none of you guessed where we are? said Peter. Go on, go on, said Lucy. I felt for hours that there was some wonderful mystery hanging over this place. "'Far ahead, Peter,' said Edmund. "'We're all listening.' "'We are in the ruins of Care Paravel itself,' said Peter. "'But I say,' replied Edmund, "'I mean, how do you make that out? "'This place has been ruined for ages. "'Look at all those big trees growing right up to the gates. "'Look at the very stones. "'Anyone can see that nobody has lived here for hundreds of years.' I know, said Peter, that is the difficulty. But let's leave that out for the moment. I want to take the points one by one. First point. This hall is exactly the same shape and size as the hall at Care Paraval. Just picture a roof on this, and a coloured pavement instead of grass, and tapestries on the walls, and you get our royal banqueting hall. No one said anything. Second point, continued Peter, the castle well is exactly where our well was, a little to the south of the great hall, and it is exactly the same size and shape. Again, there was no reply. Third point, Susan has just found one of our old chessmen, or something as like one of them as two peas. Still nobody answered. Fourth point. Don't you remember? It was the very day before the ambassadors came from the king of Calamen. Don't you remember planting the orchard outside the north gate of Care Paravel? The greatest of all the wood people, Pomona herself, came to put good spells on it. It was those very decent little chaps, the moles, who did the actual digging. Can you have forgotten that funny old Lily Gloves, the chief mole, leaning on his spade and saying, Believe me, your majesty, you'll be glad of these fruit trees one day. And by Jove, he was right. I do, I do, said Lucy, and clapped her hands. But look here, Peter, said Edmund, this must be all rot. To begin with, we didn't plant the orchard slap up against the gate. We wouldn't have been such fools. No, of course not, 
said Peter, but it has grown up to the gate since. And for another thing, said Edmund, Care Paravel wasn't on an island. Yes, I've been wondering about that, but it was a, what do you call it, a peninsula, jolly nearly an island. Couldn't it have been made an island since our time? Somebody has dug a channel. But half a moment, said Edmund, you keep on saying since our time, but it's only a year ago since we came back from Narnia. And you want to make out that in one year castles have fallen down, and great forests have grown up, and little trees we saw planted ourselves have turned into a big old orchard, and goodness knows what else. It's all impossible. There's one thing, said Lucy. If this is Care Paraval, there ought to be a door at this end of the days. In fact, we ought to be sitting with our backs against it at this moment. You know, the door that led down to the treasure chamber. I suppose there isn't a door, said Peter, getting up. The wall behind them was a mass of ivy. We can soon find out, said Edmund, taking up one of the sticks that they had laid ready for putting on the fire. He began beating the ivied wall. Tap, tap, went the stick against the stone, and again, tap, tap, and then, all at once, boom, boom, with a quite different sound, a hollow, wooden sound. "'Great Scott!' said Edmund. "'We must clear this ivy away,' said Peter. "'Oh, do let's leave it alone,' said Susan. "'We can try it in the morning. "'If we've got to spend the night here, "'I don't want an open door at my back "'and a great big black hole "'that anything might come out of. "'Besides, the draught and the damp, "'and it'll soon be dark.' "'Susan, how can you?' said Lucy with a reproachful glance. But both the boys were too much excited to take any notice of Susan's advice. They worked at the ivy with their hands, and with Peter's pocket-knife, till the knife broke. After that they used Edmund's. Soon the whole place where they had been sitting was covered with ivy, and at last they had the door cleared. "'Locked, of course,' said Peter. "'But the wood's all rotten,' said Edmund. We can pull it to bits in no time, and it will make extra firewood. Come on!" It took them longer than they expected, and, before they had done, the great hall had grown dusky, and the first star or two had come out overhead. Susan was not the only one who felt a slight shudder, as the boys stood above the pile of splintered wood, rubbing the dirt off their hands, and staring into the cold, dark opening they had made. "'Now for a torch,' said Peter. "'Oh, what is the good?' said Susan. And as Edmund said, "'I'm not saying it now,' Edmund interrupted. "'I still don't understand, but we can settle that later. I suppose you're coming down, Peter?' "'We must,' said Peter. "'Cheer up, Susan. It's no good behaving like kids now.' that we are back in Narnia. You're a queen here. And anyway, no one could go to sleep with a mystery like this on their minds. They tried to use long sticks as torches, but this was not a success. If you held them with the lighted end up, they went out, and if you held them the other way, they scorched your hand, and the smoke got in your eyes. In the end they had to use Edmund's electric torch. Luckily, it had been a birthday present less than a week ago, and the battery was almost new. He went first with the light, then came Lucy, then Susan, and Peter brought up the rear. "'I've come to the top of the steps,' said Edmund. "'Count them,' said Peter. "'One, two, three, said Edmund, as he went cautiously down and so up to sixteen. "'And this is the bottom,' he shouted back. "'Then it really must be Care Paravel, said Lucy. "'There were sixteen. Nothing more was said till all four were standing in a knot together at the foot of the stairway. Then Edmund flashed his torch slowly round. 
Oh, said all the children at once, for now all knew that it was indeed the ancient treasure chamber of Care Paravel, where they had once reigned as kings and queens of Narnia. There was a kind of path up the middle, as it might be in a greenhouse, and along each side at intervals stood rich suits of armour, like knights guarding the treasures. In between the suits of armour, and on each side of the path, were shelves covered with precious things, necklaces and arm-rings, and finger-rings, and golden bowls, and dishes, and long tusks of ivory, brooches and coronets, and chains of gold, and heaps of unset stones lying piled anyhow, as if they were marbles or potatoes, diamonds, rubies, carbuncles, emeralds, topazes, and amethysts. Under the shelves stood great chests of oak, strengthened with iron bars and heavily padlocked, and it was bitterly cold, and so still that they could hear themselves breathing, and the treasures were so covered with dust, that unless they had realized where they were, and remembered most of the things, they would hardly have known they were treasures. There was something sad and a little frightening about the place, because it all seemed so forsaken and long ago. That was why nobody said anything for at least a minute. Then, of course, they began walking about and picking things up to look at. It was like meeting very old friends. If you had been there, you would have heard them saying things like, "'Oh, look, our coronation rings! Do you remember first wearing this? Why, this is the little brooch we all thought was lost. I say, isn't that the armour you wore in the great tournament in the Lone Islands? Do you remember the dwarf making that for me? Do you remember drinking out of that horn? Do you remember? Do you remember? But suddenly Edmund said, Look here, we mustn't waste the battery. Goodness knows how often we shall need it. Hadn't we better take what we want and get out again? We must take the gifts, said Peter, for long ago at a Christmas in Narnia he and Susan and Lucy had been given certain presents which they valued more than their whole kingdom. Edmund had had no gift, because he was not with them at the time. This was his own fault, and you can read about it in the other book. They all agreed with Peter and walked up the path to the wall at the far end of the treasure chamber, and there, sure enough, the gifts were still hanging. Lucy's was the smallest, for it was only a little bottle. But the bottle was made of diamond instead of glass, and it was still more than half full of the magical cordial which would heal almost every wound and every illness. Lucy said nothing, and looked very solemn as she took her gift down from its place and slung the belt over her shoulder, and once more felt the bottle at her side, where it used to hang in the old days. Susan's gift had been a bow and arrows and a horn. The bow was still there, and the ivory quiver, full of well-feathered arrows. But, oh, Susan, said Lucy, where's the horn? Oh, bother, bother, bother! said Susan, after she had thought for a moment. I remember now. I took it with me the last day of all, the day we went hunting the white stag. It must have got lost, when we blundered back into that other place. England, I mean. Edmund whistled. It was indeed a shattering loss, for this was an enchanted horn, and whenever you blew it, help was certain to come to you wherever you were. "'Just the sort of thing that might come in handy in a place like this,' said Edmund. "'Never mind,' said Susan. "'I've still got the bow,' and she took it. "'Won't the string be perished, Sue?' said Peter. But whether by some magic in the air of the treasure chamber or not, the bow was still in working order. Archery and swimming were the things Susan was good at. In a moment she had bent the bow, and then she gave one little pluck to the string. It twanged a chirruping twang that vibrated through the whole room. And that one small noise brought back the old days to the children's minds more than anything that had happened yet. All the battles and hunts and feasts came rushing into their heads together. Then she unstrung the bow again and slung the quiver at her side. 
Next, Peter took down his gift, the shield with the great red line on it, and the royal sword. He blew and wrapped them on the floor to get off the dust. He fitted the shield on his arm and slung the sword by his side. He was afraid at first that it might be rusty and stick to the sheath, but it was not so. With one swift motion he drew it and held it up, shining in the torchlight. It is my sword, Rindon, he said. With it I killed the wolf. There was a new tone in his voice, and the others all felt that he was really Peter the High King again. Then, after a little pause, every one remembered that they must save the battery. They climbed the stair again and made up a good fire and lay down close together for warmth. The ground was very hard and uncomfortable, but they fell asleep in the end.